Welcome back to Season 3 of Comic Book Nation, the official podcast of comicbook.com. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and with me today are my co-hosts, Janelle Wheeler. Hello, hello. And Matthew Aguilar. What up? And it is post-Thanksgiving hangover day, which means it's time for some serious talk. Does Hawkeye need a TV show? We now have a new Marvel show. It's Hawkeye. It's out on Disney Plus streaming right now. And I don't know if you guys know or have listened to this show before, but uh, there's been some Hawkeye slander in this show before. There has been some notable Hawkeye slander. I mean, slander is another word this. for truth, but yeah, sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's already seen. Sure. See, this that you are hearing, this conflict you are experiencing already out of the gate, is the reason I had to dip back and get myself an ally for this episode. One of my closest allies in this industry, I'm bringing with me, over from ScreenRant.com, Mr. Rob Keys. Hey! See me? Rob. Yeah, there he is. There he is. Hey, I was Welcome. told there's some people that need to learn a few things. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Rob and I, if you guys don't know, uh, we were we met when we kind of uh, helped to build and shape what is now ScreenRant.com back in the early days of this crazy blogosphere in the, uh, what was the year? Was that like 2007, 2008? Yep. That's, that's crazy. That's like 13 years ago. That's so nuts. We're oh so old, man. I feel like <laughs> Hawkeye in this show now. Oh my God. <laughs> I can hear about as well. Um, But anyway, so Rob is back with me because uh, Rob is a noted Hawkeye fan. Uh, and Jim, no, I'm not a Hawkeye lover or a Hawkeye hater. That's the opposite. I am have taken Rob's creed that I preach over here all the time of how this man is the heart and soul of the Avengers. So that's the side I'm arguing for, and, I, and I'm stacking the deck with Rob on my side to take on Matt and wherever Janelle Wheeler stands. You can never know in these things. But, uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm Canada. <laughs> so, Matt, since you came out so peppery, why don't you tell us what you think, since you don't think Hawkeye is the man, at least not Clint Barton, but the real Hawkeye is the man – what did you think of the series so far? I was very confused by that state. <laughs> I'm a little lost, I'm not gonna lie. So yeah, I what's crazy is I don't know why. So since we got the first trailer of Hawkeye, I've actually been excited for this series. You've and been excited like for a Christmas show. I was no, 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 because that's never what I said. Now Christmas helps. I have a Christmas hat that I'm saving for next week. I almost wore for this one because I'm excited and I already have the decorations up. I'm I'm excited for that. That makes it, but like. This is a, and you have a question here that I think is perfect because it's not a bait and switch to me. The reason I'm coming to the show is, is Kate Bishop. It's always been that way. I said when they did the first announcements of this show, I was not excited. And then they went, oh, it's a kind of a handing of the baton to the next Hawkeye and Kate Bishop. And I went, oh, this is wonderful. I'm excited for that show. And by the way, that's what this show is. Like Hawkeye is a side character. And when I say Hawkeye, I mean the current Hawkeye, Clint Barton, in the MCU. This show is about Kate Bishop. Like, it's not really about, like, it deals with some things, but it's not really about Clint. It's about Kate. And that's why I like it. And so far, the first two episodes, which I've seen, I know other people have seen more. Like, first two episodes, really, really good. Like, I enjoyed, I enjoyed this. But I enjoy it for all the same reasons that I knew I was going to enjoy it. Clint doesn't, there was one scene and I don't know how, are we doing spoilers, non-spoilers? What are we doing? It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's days later. Do okay. Spoilers. Go so, ahead. like, there was one scene to me that I actually feel like I got to know Clint just a little bit more. And ironically, it's not any of the ones with the kids, because those are very surface most times. Uh, it's literally the phone call he has with his wife. Um, there's that one phone call, and then the, the scene where the LARPing scene, which is a great sequence but like that scene i actually feel like i got to know him as a person just a little bit more uh and the same way with that phone call scene that's it <laughs> there's nothing else in the show that like screams oh man i root for clint it's it's kate that brings all that out of him i mean it's been that way since he entered the mcu so that's how i feel about before we get into larger stuff that's how i feel about the show i'm really excited like i'm actually not saying the show is bad or that you shouldn't watch you're the down with the bait and switch of it all it's it's not though it's been it's not how is it a bait and switch when she's been in all the marketing and the show was teased first as it's kind we, of a yes we know it's a, right but did we know that it would actually I don't think we knew that it would open up on Kate Bishop and be so heavily Kate Bishop 
heavy in the first episode. As you say, there is an argument to be made that based on the focus of how this show starts, that Kate Bishop is the primary character over Clint Barton. And I don't know if that was like as settled. I thought it was going to be kind of more of a balanced thing. But that's kind of like we're getting into the weeds here. Um, I'm like the total opposite of you. I think that I like the Clint Barton aspect of this. I think this is doing what WandaVision did in a very different way, but no less effective, which is taking a character who's been kind of always on the sides of these MCU movies and actually giving them a deeper character arc. And I really like that because I think Hawkeye's writers are doing a good job of mixing kind of the Matt Fraction stuff with the MCU stuff, but also kind of a very clever winking meta commentary on Renner's role in the MCU and who Hawkeye is and just taking a lot of the kind of fun, you know, poking fun at a lot of the hate that Hawkeye gets as like, you know, he's not as cool as the other Avengers or just people like Matt hanging around all the time. I don't know, but uh, just taking that and, and making you sympathetic to how Hawkeye feels about all this and kind of doing that. And those are kind of the things that I like best about these. The Kate Bishop, Haley Steinfeld is great. Don't get me wrong. I don't want like a bunch of Kate Bishop stands on my Twitter door, but like Haley Steinfeld is that character. I think somebody put it, I think one of maybe Jenna or Nicole, one of our uh, Marvel DC experts here said that like, you know, or maybe it was you, Matt. And somebody said that not since like, Tony Stark in, you know, in the MCU has a character that would just been somebody stepped in and been like, okay, that person is that character since Haley Steinfeld is going to be Kate Bishop. Like no arguments there. I think it was me. Oh uh, yeah. I think that might have been you. <laughs> I, might have I have that. trouble you giving you credit for wise things you say, I, I, I know that. That, but I'm working on it, but uh, I have trouble, but yeah, but um, she's plucky. Episode, she's fun. She's great. Yeah. I mean, I could have seen her in her own YA series and being just as happy, but uh, it is, this makes Hawkeye cooler to me in, in a way that the MCU movies did. And just seeing how Hawkeye's getting to develop, we've only seen him really kind of having to interact with these godlike people and, and putting him in this weird kind of sub submissive role because he's just the guy with a bow, as he says in like Age of Ultron. But seeing him out in the world and how regular people look at him and kind of grasp onto him as a very human person that they can admire in that LARPing scene, like the ridiculousness of that LARPing scene is undercut by how kind of just genuinely like nice of a character moment it is for Hawkeye to meet people who look at him and that other guy in the, in the Ronin costume and being like, yeah, this guy inspires people in him getting some validation and having some fun out of that whole thing. Like I, I think I like that stuff the most about the series, but uh, you and I have yelled at each other. Let's get to our guest and Janelle. Uh, Rob, what do you think so far? Yeah, I think I'm leaning towards you, uh, obviously. Um, it's funny, the LARPing scene, I didn't actually love at first, but it, it grows on me the more I think about what it means to the other characters around him. Like you, you said, inspiration is a good word for it. But Matt, one other scene which I thought you may have appreciated on, on the Clint side is the sequence where uh, Kate and Clint are just walking in the streets together. And she's talking about what you need is branding. And he's yeah. like... It, it really doubles down on the emphasis of, of the point. He, he doesn't need recognition. He's not looking for glory. He doesn't even want a free meal. He doesn't want anyone noticing him. He just wants to chill out and hang out with his family. But that reluctance is so interesting because that's what always brings him back in. Because no matter what, no matter what he's been through or how much he sacrificed or how much how much of a risk there is to take um, as a guy who doesn't wear armor or use cosmic artifacts, who doesn't have powers, doesn't use guns, doesn't fly, doesn't do anything, he will still do the right thing uh, in every step of the way. And he will always hold back because you know – when he's fighting like the people on the street to save Kate and get the Ronin costume the first time or in the LARPing scene or in any action sequence or when he gets caught and breaks out like Natasha would have, he's always holding back. You know, if he wants to, he can take out everyone in the room with his hands and, and he doesn't. And I, I think there's so many layers to that and it's very subtle, but I love the idea. This guy is so done with it. Just leave me alone. But he always gets pulled in and his family is there always, especially his wife is always there to support him. So I think that, that really does speak to what he represents to the original six Avengers and that heart and soul yeah, and, and like, that inspiration element. Can we just say Linda Cardellini has like the most badass role in the MCU. She just like <laughs> is, she gets the wife role, but it's like, she just like, all right, but she's like the best ultimate wife. She role. gets it. Yeah. Yeah. That phone call seems so good. Cause she just, you know, that really got me on a relationship level. Cause he was just like, Oh yeah. Hawkeye tells his wife everything. Like, right. You know, another show she, he would have been like, Oh, making up some story, but she's like, Oh, is this happening? Did you get a costume back? Because you're screwed if you don't. Like, and he's like, Yeah, I get it. And I love the, the banter where she's like, she keeps going back and forth with the kids. 
<laughs> and then she like she gives them something to like you know like eat a little bit as far as like something hey have this thought for a minute and then she goes yeah. right back to his and without like missing a beat she just like is back and forth and, well i mean and as somebody managing a household right now that is the type of mental jujitsu you have to do it's the only right? way you can maintain sanity in your house and so you gotta throw that. them a distraction like and then keep going back to what you were saying in episode two when he's about to like surrender himself to be captured and she's like oh yeah you're doing the catch and release no problem like it's just such a normal nonchalant thing yeah. to her but yeah a special relationship for sure Man, I feel like I feel like there's a lot of heart for this Hawkeye thing in here. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Janelle. <laughs> yeah. Keep the train going. Yeah, I am crazy about this show. I am so excited. First of all, any reference to the blip and any kind of call to from like any of, you know, this last sequence thing that we've we went through. Like I loved it in WandaVision. I I I love I love the tie-ins to everything. Like that is what keeps me excited about all of these projects is just definitely getting kind of like a taste of like, okay, what was everybody else doing? What happened for these other people during that time? Because it was it was a life-changing, altering, world-shifting thing. Um, so I loved that. I, I actually have too much Kate. I want more Clint. So I'm a little opposite of Matt on that one because um, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with her at all. I've never read her comics. Like, I don't know who she is, but she also did a great job of winning me over. Like, I'm very excited about her. She's so freaking likable and cool and relatable. I love that. I just do want more Clint because I, I feel like I never got to know him, which is why I never cared about him ever. Like, the, the most powerful thing for me was him watching the musical. Him being so uncomfortable watching like what was going on on that stage. But like, I almost cried because I felt for him watching Natasha. Like I felt for him watching cap. Like these are his buddies that are gone. And I, I really, really, really felt for him in that because I was like, this is literally horrifying. Like you don't put a war veteran on, you know, watching a, a Broadway musical about world war two and, you know, it's, it's just, it was just really interesting. It was an interesting choice how they like make that satirical. I don't, it was just cool. But other than that, like, I'm just really invested. I'm really excited. I love Clint now. I, I, I understand where he's coming from and they did it in two episodes. Like they made me like Hawkeye in two episodes because this is someone that was always just like, oh, God, it's Hawkeye. Like, like I'm bored. Like, I don't want anything to do with that. And that is – and by the way, this was so much better than Falcon Winter Soldier. Let me just <laughs> – so I mean, much better. I, don't I mean, mean, I'm I not going to argue. I don't even yeah, think that's no. a close I don't think that's argument a either. Yeah, yeah, I agree with no, you. No, I'm not going to debate that one. No. Satisfied. Um, yeah, and how long before Rogers the Musical is a thing? Because I mean, what a songbook! They really put some effort into that song. <laughs> like, yeah, but boy, those costumes sucked. You're I know. like, man, I've seen Broadway do stuff, and like, that is no, there's no way. Did you watch The Lion King? No, <laughs> like, there's no way <laughs> Hawkeye's wearing like terrible. a tank top. Dude, on if you state. ever live yeah. in New York, though, that Times Square scene is so good. It's so good when they go to Times Square and there's all the cosplayers and there's Katniss Everdeen and stuff. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah. Well, just... as Rob okay. mentioned, though, like that was part of. Look, that's what's great about the Rosenberg run. That's what's great about when they interact in Kelly Thompson's books. Like the back and forth between them has always been great, especially when they were sharing the same code name. It was like whole runs where like they're the back and forth and the meta stuff, that stuff is from straight from the comics in a, in a lot of ways, that same dynamic. That's the, to me, the most compelling stuff here is when they're together. And for me, the Clint stuff on his own it's just not as interesting. Why? Because kind of like Janelle said, to this point, this is probably, aside from that one scene, I got everyone points to that one scene in uh, Age of Ultron, <laughs> where we actually get to like see some of that facade pulled away, uh, and then some stuff in Endgame, right? There's there's not been a ton of meaty Hawkeye stuff. There just hasn't. Like most of it is focused on his action. Most of it's focused on what he can do. And it's fun banter stuff, right? But it's light. And to me, they actually really do a good job here of like having the banter from the comics, but also getting into some of 
each of their own personal stories a little bit more uh, early on, then I actually really appreciate it. So I want more of that. But if you look at these episodes, both as a, like a whole, they don't actually spend a great deal of time together. Like they're, they're together for like little spurts and then yeah. they both go their own way. I want more of them actually together. Like those scenes that people are talking about in the trailers, those are from great sequences as well. Like when they're in the yeah, car, we know the episode right. three will be the car sequence. Right. So yeah. like those things, that's what I'm, most excited about i mean geez the end of episode two right that's a perfect like that's a perfect example like that's that's why kate's fun as a character she's so unsure of herself sometimes as a leader but she's and even sometimes as her abilities but like that's why it bounces so well for clint yeah. who's so confident in his abilities and so knows his craft well uh but i just want sometimes in the comics they get a little more into the person of clint and the mcu has never done that for me this is probably the most they've done it, but I still, I'm not going to like, it's not going to overwhelm me and go like, oh yes, <laughs> this is this is the Clint thing I've been waiting for. I need more of that, but I do like what is there. I just need more of it. Well, I'm happy that they started with the Ronin thing. I'm happy that that got brought back into the spotlight and that's what kind of galvanized this series is the reappearance of Ronin because it is this big character chunk and probably the most dynamic, interesting thing about Hawkeye that we've had in the MCU. And now we're getting into kind of the ramifications of all that and what he did as Ronan when he didn't think he had his family and what that means about Clint and why he needs this stuff and what kind of darkness he has going on under there and, you know, how that's going to come back on him. And so that's the part I really kind of liked. And, and I like that they roped Kate Bishop in that way because that was at least some good connective tissue between the two. Um, I just think the Kate Bishop stuff is, is the part that feels like it's going to go kind of Netflix on me with the kind of family drama yeah. and the secrets and stuff. But that's not to say shout out my boy, Tony Dalton from better call Saul. If you guys never saw Tony Dalton and better call Saul as um, the Salamanca brother, we didn't meet in breaking bad. Wow. He is. I mean, this guy is a great character actor and he was freaky as hell in better call Saul. And he is great in this too. Like he just eats up every scene he is as Kate's stepfather yeah. Yeah. um jack especially Duquesne. knowing who that is right yeah how and do you say his last name i always say Duquesne, but i feel like i never wrong. say it for yeah. that reason i never know <laughs> uh, anyway as jack and uh yeah we know who he is in the marvel comics as swordsman and you know that that's all coming and they have that great scene which is one of my favorite scenes which is him in the fencing scene and kind of playing down his abilities but again that feels like this is the one that's going to go kind of like netflix or like luke cage netflix on me with all the side stories and stuff also but, not um, gonna lie that larp scene had me uh a little uh, i'm a little worried in a way that i was not necessarily worried in the in the comics and i don't want to get into like spoiler things for that but like i hope I, it's one of those things where like you know something happens and you kind of hope they divert and go a different way because like i really came out of that scene liking <laughs> particular people and i was like please please don't please don't hurt them <laughs> i was very much like that's where i had left that scene i was like no please i love them no oh man so wrapping up any things rob know what do you yeah, guys yeah. so when we answer the question does hawkeye deserve a tv show that was our whole premise here i say absolutely you got to get into what the real human heart of the avengers is and what the cost of this superheroing is. And Thor ain't ever going to really do that. He's going to crack jokes about it. But uh, Wow, wait Hawkeye, a Randomly Hawkeye, eat on Thor. <laughs> Hawkeye will. Um, yeah, I'll say it's it's smart to what Matt was saying. We haven't gotten much Clint Barton in the MCU so far. And we know years ago, Kofi and I spoke with the Rousseau's back. Remember this? Back when the Winter Soldier came out in home video? And for like 45 minutes. And they told us the whole plan for the Hawkeye sequence in the Winter Soldier that they got cut. Because of scheduling, oh, you would have seen it. Yeah. You would have seen a lot more of his character there, and how he's loyal. He's not. Let's just say he's not a company man. He's fiercely loyal to those he should be loyal to, which is great. He always knows. Um, but but the main point I wanted to say is it's smart that doing this one of the original six as a TV show because you're getting three, you know, three movies worth of screen time mm -hmm. uh, to play with, which is much needed. And I think where I do agree with you. I hope we get more of that back and forth contrast between Kate and Clint. Cause that really sells it. Her naivety and his, like, like you said, confidence and skill. And I don't want to talk about it. I don't have to answer for, my, for myself. I'm only here cause I have to be, and I'm going home. <laughs> uh, I love that. But I, I do agree. One thing I will say though, I think fans who have been anticipating this for a long time 
probably wanted to see more of Clint's origin story. Like, how did he get into S.H.I.E.L.D.? Why did he become this assassin? Why was he sent after Natasha? And then the other part of it is, like, I want to see, like, I want to see him as Ronin, traveling the world, taking out cartels and crime yeah. syndicates and always winning, like, trying to balance out evil in his yeah. own way. We wrote that so many awesome. Ronin stories back in the day. Man, totally. then we just got a tease. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, no, I totally deserved. All right, Janelle. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, he gets his own show. And now I have a little bit more faith with these upcoming projects that maybe I'm not as familiar with. Um, and I'm kind of like, oh man, I wish they would have done something else. Like I'm I feel I feel excited and hopeful for the future because I think they did a heck of a job here. And uh, and I'm just really excited to see more. I'm this is my favorite holiday viewership like of the season like this is very exciting for me and i'm gonna get to watch it twice because my fiance hasn't watched it yet and i'm i'm down like i already told him i'm like hey are we gonna watch it today like i want to i want to rewatch the episode so that's a good sign <laughs> matt you're you're the last one does hawkeye deserve a tv series matt yeah okay there you go that was easy <laughs> I, was, I was hoping somebody would be like a, a little bit harder for a holdout on this but um yeah, Hawkeye, now streaming. You guys can check that out, and uh, long time coming. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying it. I think if we if we want to rank, because this is our last Disney Plus Marvel series of the year, so let's just do a oh, quick yeah, ranking right. around the room. I'd say um, I go Loki is still my favorite. Mm, I mean, Hawkeye's still early, but uh, if I'm just going from the premiere episodes, the first twos that I, I mean, I saw of everything, I'd say um, it was Loki's my favorite, Hawkeye's my second favorite, WandaVision's third, um, mm, Falcon and Winter Soldier, I guess I'll do fourth, and What If fifth. Oh, What If we're counting? Okay, yeah. Yeah, All right. um, well, actually, yeah, I mean, yeah, What If fifth. No, okay. I'll stick with that. I am Loki, WandaVision, What If, Hawkeye, Falcon. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Rob? Uh, good question. I would say what if is not even in the same level. It's, I really didn't like that. But the rest of the shows, I will say this, they all have like high ups and low lows, but for different reasons, they all come out at the end of it, like six and a half or seven out of 10 in terms of like a quality scale. This one is kind of there mostly in the first two episodes as well. But I do think given what we talked about, this one has potential to push it further if they do what we want them to do in the final back half of the season. So I'm very hopeful, but I would agree that Loki's probably top tier because I think that was pretty special in its own way. Yeah, uh, Loki's my Loki's my hands down favorite. But if like Hawkeye has the potential to like battle that out, depending on wow. what happens next, so I will say Hawkeye's second. Um, oh, <laughs> WandaVision <laughs> third, um, fourth, uh, Cap and Winter Soldier, and then what if probably my last. But you said so Winter just, Soldier, yeah, so we just said the same thing. Cap, but Cap, I almost flipped it because Cap and Winter Soldier, it's like. Like Rob said, the highs are really high. Like there's some great stuff in there, like the Isaiah Bradley stuff. I would have just taken a whole series of that. Like I don't need half of the other junk that's in there. And so like if that was flipped, I would put that there. Um, but, you know, and what if I even like stuff too? Like I'm not hating on any. Yeah, I like I like the back half of what if a lot. I did not like the front half of what it's if. Just, yeah, much. I think uh, part the lows drug that down further. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's last for me. All right, well, that's it. So I guess we say go watch Hawkeye if you guys yeah, are cool. into it because uh, Heart and Soul of Avengers needs a TV show. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, we got to talk. There's a bunch of new Geek TV we got to run down, and we got some really exciting new comics we got to talk about this week, and I'm, I'm excited for that. But uh, Rob Keyes has a lot to do, so he's going to drop out. He's here. Thank you, for my friend, for coming on and helping Thank me. Thank you all. Hawkeye. Go watch Hawkeye. Best yeah. Avenger. And uh, you can check out Rob's keys over at ScreenRant.com. Uh, which you guys know, I'm sure. We already guys getting shout outs in the comments. So uh, we'll be right back after this break. This is Comic Book Nation. Stay tuned.
Got What's up? Me. We're back. Matt's having a moment up there. <laughs> it totally got me this time. The- We're back. This is Comic Book Nation, and uh, <laughs> we just finished our segment, Does Hawkeye Deserve a TV Show? Though there were debates about the quality of that TV show, the answer was a resounding yes. <laughs> so now we are going to talk about our big geek TV rundown. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff. If you're, you know, if you're a fan and, and into kind of geek culture, we actually have some new TV that's coming our way at the end of the year. And, you know, holiday season is upon us. People are settling down and, and looking for stuff to watch. So we're here with our uh, What to Watch segment extended edition today with a big geek centric bend to it. So, what to watch? You guys have anything else you want to? Oh, Matt did throw some stuff in here. I knew his agenda would be worth it. Yeah, I even told you before. <laughs> you knew it was coming. So first up, let's talk about Netflix, the new Cowboy Bebop series that premiered on Netflix. Uh, it premiered a week ago, but uh, we were busy. And so we needed some time to kind of take this in and digest. And of course, Cowboy Bebop was one of the more transformative anime series of the early 2000s. It's really kind of the one I credit with taking anime from this niche thing where it was for kids like me in the 90s who had to go run around your city trying to find like anime tapes and bootlegs and stuff just to get that stuff to um, being this mainstream explosion, which was followed swiftly by like the rebroadcastings of Dragon Ball Z, Naruto making its debut. The Cowboy Bebop was that kind of crossover mainstream one with its funk, hip jazz records and the vinyls and the whole style of the show and everybody trying to be Spike Spiegel after that and, you know, that whole thing. So and a live action adaptation has been kind of a tricky proposition ever since their fans are fiercely loyal, of course, to Cowboy Bebop. No secret there. You know, the whole idea of doing a Hollywood thing, whitewashing it with, you know, Actors, it's, it's been that whole thing. So we've, yeah. Netflix finally has jumped in. They got this show. And uh, John Cho from, you know, Harold and Kumar and everything else is Spike Spiegel. Mustafa Shakir, who was in uh, Luke Cage. And uh, that HBO show, The Deuce, is Jet Black. Daniela, Daniela Pineda as Faye Valentine. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on in the show. But um, this has been kind of a split reception, I'd say. There's a lot of people who enjoy Cowboy Bebop, you know, because people love John Cho. It's hard to hate John Cho. People love that the series is... But there are other people who just don't like the fact that this seems to be a kind of carbon copy of the anime of or just them doing kind of pantomime of the anime. And it... I get that. I get that. I still kind of have been enjoying the series for seeing that kind of homage to the anime because I still find it fun. And and I find it weird that we've come such a long way because when Robert Rodriguez did all this with just nothing but green screen and called it in black and white and called it Sin City, we were all in awe and like, ugh. But all he did again was create a living comic book. Same with Zack Snyder and 300 and Watchmen. And um, there's always been this kind of comic book movie or TV series approach to doing these adaptations, right? Like, we're just going to make the comic book alive on screen. And I feel like, in a lot of ways, Netflix has done that with um, Cowboy Bebop. And and it's accented certain things that weren't as accented to me in the anime. A lot of the dirtier humor of it and kind of that stuff is a lot more pronounced when you see it in live action. And I think the cast does a good job. I like all of the cast in their roles. John Cho might be the hardest for me to buy, but like I love John Cho, so it's hard to hate him. Uh, And Mustafa Shakir and Daniela Pineda are both great in the show. Daniela Pineda is like really great as Faye Valentine. She's like a scene stealer and I really enjoy her. And I love Mustafa Shakir. So I don't think there was a thing. It's Norin is rad is pointing out in the comments actually right now. Like, and I agree with him. It's kind of like that rock in a hard place, right? Like, I don't think you could have done your own version of Cowboy Bebop and not pissed everybody off. Right. I don't think you can recreate Cowboy Bebop and people saying you're not doing anything new. Like in, you know, just doing it, but um, that fandom sucks sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> like, and no, Lord. Jim, I don't think it was. I think if you thought the what? original was <laughs> exciting, you'll. I, I mean, this one's exciting that. for the same reasons. <laughs> and if you didn't, if the original put you to sleep in the long musical sequences and, and artistic style of it, this isn't going to be much different. So, that's just okay. me. What did you guys think, Janelle? Oh gosh, um, I am a huge fan. Like surprisingly, I I kind of went in going, what? I I know nothing about this. I am not anime person at all, and I left 
like I couldn't stop watching. Like I had to keep watching. I was like, oh, I'll watch like three episodes so that I can talk about it on the podcast. No, no, no. I watched the entire thing. Um, I I love everything about it, but again, I don't have to hold it up against this like, you know, preconceived thing of what it is. Like I just get to appreciate what I'm seeing. Um and stop okay. because that is the key right here. I didn't yeah. touch on that, but you're the kind of sample person that we need. And I and I love everything you just said. Like you did not, I mean, you've known about Cowboy Bebop. I mean, sure you've heard about it. I'm sure you've heard all the crazy fandom, but that never made you want yeah. to go out and watch the anime. Right. You saw this. And the name alone, you, I was like, yeah. the name is so stupid. What the heck is a Cowboy Bebop? Like, are you serious? And then like, you didn't, I mean, we forced you to do this for work, but like, once you got into it, you discovered it and you're like, oh, I actually like, yes, enjoyed give this. me season two. So like, it's helped it. you discover Cowboy Bebop. And exactly. the anime has never been a bigger talking point until this show has come back. Yeah. It is now topping Netflix and, and getting in popular, not just the live action, but the anime. And isn't that kind of what you want, guys? Like, Yeah. I do. I, I really think that's true. I mean, even like just the music, like the soundtrack was so good. The cinematography, everything was beautiful and just really cool. And it didn't feel like they cheaped out on anything like the mm -hmm. sets or the costuming. Like it just felt really professional and nice. Like it was really cool. Yeah. I, and I also thought because because I agree with that, I think. I think that it really just depends on how you go into these things. You know, I loved Sin City and that is a straight up <laughs> recreation, but I loved that. That's what I was looking for. Like, I didn't want you to reinvent the wheel. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with direct adaptations. At the same time, I'm also okay with you taking it. And, you know, typically what most shows do now is kind of like, they'll, they'll stay close to like two or three core storylines throughout. And then they'll make, three big changes that like piss everybody off <laughs> They'll like de-age someone or make them older or like that's kind of the rule right but like these things are supposed to actually they're not made in a vacuum i feel like they are supposed to pull people into the franchise and i think the visuals in this show do a really good job of like i think this show does a really good job of setting you up for what to expect from the anime if this so interests you to go check it out you won't be like completely like oh this is completely different you'll have a good foundation and then you'll enjoy the eccentricities and things that the anime brings that this doesn't so i think it's actually what i mean geez movies Marvel DC movies have been trying to do this forever, right? You want people to go check out the rest of the world. You want them to check out the comics after they see the movie. They're not supposed to be silos by themselves. So, yeah, I think it's good. I I, thought, I liked it. I wasn't like over the moon, but I liked it. All right. There you go. Cowboy Bebop. So, doesn't reinvent the wheel. Not like the thing, not maybe the greatest TV show on its own, but does a good job of kind of inspiring you back into the Cowboy Bebop franchise and sets the stage for more to come right like we've got to get to know it i mean there's still stuff we got to do here so i was surprised that i liked it as much as i did because it was such a cornerstone of of kind of my development i had been into anime like i said but this was the one where i saw that one was like and people started asking me to get their hands on the dvd and all that stuff and that's where i saw the change and i was like oh okay so this was pivotal and yeah that soundtrack i know like the back of my hand so i, I was pleasantly surprised by this so that's our first kind of geek TV debut. Our next one is, man, Hit Monkey on Hulu. So new Marvel series. If you didn't know, Hulu still has some Marvel stuff. Uh, it, it's kind of unrolling in their unofficial corner of the universe. What the hell but, is uh, that division? I, I have no <laughs> <laughs> Deals we already made. Deals we already yeah, made. Yeah, deals we already Hulu. made the yeah. series. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but uh, Hit Monkey is the new newest one. And I didn't, this has been like one of the least marketed. This trailer shows. sucked. That yeah. first trailer they released for this blew. And I was yeah. like, oh, this is going to be And terrible. this is kind of series you really need to sell people on. But again, I was pleasantly surprised when I sat down to watch this. Because this series is just ridiculous crazy. I'm only about three episodes into it. But um, I enjoy it a lot. And if you don't know, the the basic premise is, as the title says, it's about a monkey who learns to be a hitman um, after establishing this weird spiritual connection with an actual hitman. Um, but what re I mean, let's be honest, what really makes this series for me is the same thing that makes Ted Lasso for me, which is just the presence, the overwhelming <laughs> presence of Jason Sudeikis <laughs> and... And his ability to just sell you on 
anything crazy. Like so good. It's his banter because I didn't under I knew nothing about this character. I, I've never I've never experienced it. Like I don't even know if it is a comic. Like I yeah I didn't ever. I'm not gonna lie, this. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's not one I would pick up on my own, but um, it, it's funny because Jason Sudeikis is the hitman, and you know I'm not going to spoil what happens, but he becomes kind of connected to this monkey and is able to communicate with him, and so most of the show is just Jason Sudeikis because it is a monkey. The monkey doesn't talk, so it's Jason Sudeikis doing banter in, in as kind of like this monkey's like advisor, right, on how to be a hitman, and uh, it's hyper violent, like hyper just everything like it's kind of like invincible to the yeah in, in in terms of how extreme it just takes things but a whole lot of fun and Sudeikis really Sudeikis Sudeikis really kind of Sudoku I'm taking Sudoku Sudeikis really does make this fun with the banter um I'm not gonna get too deep with it what did you guys think it's so weird. Uh, it's weird. just weird. Like, I'm already not really into anime or animated stuff anyways. And then this just is, like, so bloody and graphic. And, I like, it's just weird. I wouldn't say I dislike it. I would just say it's weird. <laughs> it's, like, a strange concept. You show and, notes say it all, right? Yeah. I, I Like, I feel like if you like animated stuff like this is an easy yes for for that if you're not really into animation i would just i, I you can try it but i don't know if i'm gonna stick by like I'll, i watched three episodes and i'm kind of like i get it it's a it's a monkey doing stuff uh <laughs> and now i'm i'm good like i i'm ready to go watch something else <laughs> but monkeys rule you know i hate monkeys, monkeys are though. awesome now most so, of the monkeys i don't like monkeys I, truth be told what? that's i know I, that's like my least favorite animal on the planet they freak me out so that's probably just me but wow. I did feel emotionally bad for him like I was like oh my gosh we don't usually pass monkey. judgment on comic book nation but when we do <laughs> What is with the monkey hate? I yeah, the monkey, monkey that, hate that owns at the zoo. Comic. I'm like this, like, I avoid, I don't, mm -mm. they oh, freak man. me out. Well, we've learned a lot. Well, <laughs> yes, we, 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 yes, we so they I tear was, people's faces off and stuff. So, I was gonna pitch because, okay, most of the monkeys, <laughs> this is such a weird only in our space <laughs> sentence I'm about to say. All the monkeys I'm really familiar with are in the DC universe, <laughs> so like Detective Chimp, Monkey King, like, those are, like, there's a couple of right, so I'm not really like familiar with with hit monkey and that trailer as i said before just did not catch me like it's just like the animation looked awful i was just not a fan and then i watched this in like the first 10 minutes of the show and i was like why where is that like where is this horrible show that i'm supposed to be watching because i very much went in with kind of like a skewed thing and then like i the show is awesome i i was i was all at the edge of my seat and going like i need to watch the next episode like this sudeikis is, is so charming and like it's just his kind of rolling off like his talking to himself thing like when he calls himself a jerk and whatever like he's so charming also um uh olivia munn's voice we don't get to see her character a lot in the uh, kind of earlier episodes but like she, again this is really quality voice acting uh off the top so like the stuff that you're supposed to be engaged in you are engaged in uh and there's a little bit more of a as opposed to invincible which is like straight up superhero punch fest um, and not in a bad way, by the way, I love the principle, but like, this is a little more like, there's just like a little more style to the fight scenes and the way, like he's, he's carving people up. And I'm like, that, that's cool. Like, it just has a little bit of it. I did not expect to love the series. And now it's just like, I can't, I gotta watch, I gotta finish yeah, it. The fight care. sequences are actually good. And they actually throw like a horror movie element into yeah. it because it's like, these people facing this monkey who can do all kinds of monkey stuff. So there's a lot of monkey hate in the comments. Man, what is with Jim, so Jim, many Jim, are you recreating your wife to just throw monkey hate onto our show? Wow. Man, this is, this is next level. Yes, next girl. level. Yes, Mallory. <laughs> That's Jim's wife. I have a monkey that owns a taco. Respect Mrs. Vicardi, Mrs. Vicardi's opinion. We'll respect nice. you guys' opinions on the monkey mm -hmm. hate, but I Man, cannot rock so with you, me and Matt. Here. Yeah, well, no, we're gonna go fame. Uh, Jane, <laughs> I literally Jane, logged on to be Goodall, on your side. For this. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have our monkey preserve, that. Matt. The proceeds yes. from this show eventually, somewhere in 2020, uh, 99, we'll open our monkey preserve. <laughs> okay, and call out, show. let's call out Jim for not commenting for Mallory. <laughs> 
<laughs> you would not comment. It's okay. We need more viewerships. Great. Amazing. We love, we love you logged in, Mal. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim says the show sucks. Thank you, Jim. Oh my God, Jeez. Jim. That's just Get monkey hate here. left and right. We're moving on yeah. to happier things. Let's yeah. talk something that everybody Let's can agree is awesome. Happy things on this yes, the, the mountain of entertainment over on Paramount Plus. So over on Paramount Plus, yesterday, oh. the Star Trek Discovery season four is now out. Uh, we're not going to go too in depth here because I'm the biggest Trek head here, and it's just me talking. I've said enough today, but it's now out. And uh, as the season develops and big things develop, we'll talk about it. But make sure you stream that Star Trek Discovery for all my Trek heads is now available on Paramount Plus. And they just released yesterday during Thanksgiving the first of these crazy amount of South Park, uh, we don't even know what to call them, movies, specials, features, that we got 14 of them coming our way on Paramount+. Plus. And the first one came out yesterday, and it was South Park post-COVID. If you haven't known during since the uh, you know ongoing two years since the pandemic started, uh, South Park, like everybody else, had to kind of find new ways to do their productions. And so they started just instead of making their crazy seasons, they just started making these specials. Um, and they did like, uh, yeah, they did one about the pandemic and one about vaccinations and stuff like that. And so this is post COVID. But um, this was surprisingly novel and entertaining South Park story, because what it does is it does this time jump into the future. Uh, the joke being that by the time we're finally done with like the panic, the fear and everything about COVID, it's going to be like decades in the future. And, um, all the kids of South Park are middle-aged men now. And, uh, that was a surprisingly novel and fresh way to kind oh of come my into God, South Park. You already sold me. I got to watch this. <laughs> yeah. To come into South Park and, and see this again, it was kind of like getting a reboot of the show and it's pretty hilarious in this special. Which is, again, they're not movies because this isn't a complete story. It's just yeah. like one big arc instead of just an episode. It's just one bigger arc story that is still going to be serialized like recent seasons of the show. Because either the next season of the show will pick up where this special left off or the next special will. I'm not sure how they're doing it yet. So oh, this man. is just one I hope it's beginning part of a story. Format. I do too because this yeah. was very fun to watch and entertaining. It was fun and I think that was a takeaway. It was fun to watch a long South Park episode that could actually take us time and have like a longer development and, and yeah. not just rapid fire raunch jokes and stuff at you, but take its time and have like kind of more character work in depth because they have gone serialized in the last like five or six years with the show. And it's all one kind of evolving Canon. And there's a lot of fun stuff that they've been building on, like from integrity and they've integrated into real life from their actual weed farm, integrity farms, which is a real life thing that they put in the show to just, Everything they're doing with the pandemic. And like an important thing. Yeah. It's like it's like very important. It's not yeah, even just, it's just like, like the episode where Randy goes to China, that famous episode where he slammed where they slam like Disney Marvel and everybody about doing business in China. And there's something that happened in that episode that you know has fed into this whole thing. Like South Park um, was never a show that I always was like, Oh yeah, they really like you know, pay attention to their continuity and like <laughs> their storylines, whatever, but they really do because like yeah. a lot of those long running things are still around and still have like you know, ripple effects and stuff. Yeah, I didn't. Ex I didn't expect that. No, and um, but yeah, but seeing the kids. Let's just. I mean, the the, the way they reintroduce the kids as middle aged men in almost this kind of it like fashion with Stan having to come back to town and and deal with like what happened and the mystery of why they got separated and all that stuff. Um, it, it was pretty hilarious, and I, I really, I kind of really enjoyed that one. I loved the second half of this more than I loved the first half because, like. So for me, right, yes, like I, as a South Park fan that's like was really huge into the show the first couple seasons and then kind of tapered off. And now it's just like I watch episodes here and there or groups of episodes, you know, um, like the the they are, there is there are always curmudgeonly and they're always like saying like really like crazy things sometimes. But like Kyle and Stan are like outright unlikable people for like the first half of this movie <laughs> and in fact probably it's 75 percent of this movie but like the first half of this movie they are like unlikable and they are your two main characters for the most part until Cartman gets amazingly introduced uh later on so like they're real like to me it was just kind of like it kind of started to like get on my nerves a little bit of like okay i get it like i i need some kind of movement in their characters and it does happen 
but like it happens way late. I mean, this thing's like an hour long. So it like happens way late into the thing. And I'm like, okay, we could have sped that up a little bit. We could have gotten to certain parts a little bit sooner. Cause like, I don't like them. Like they're just annoyed. They're kind of great on me or whatever. And I like those characters in the show as their normal kid selves. Right. Um, but, but like, it does pay yeah. off at the end. And the, and so, uh, someone mentioned it in the comments, the cliffhanger is great. So yeah. like they hooked me for the next one. It was just like, I wish we would have gotten there quicker, you know, than, than we did. I think that was kind of the point, though, because in the regular show, it's like Stan and Kyle are your relatable characters, and Cartman and Kenny are two of the more extreme characters for more of the extreme humor. And in this, it was kind of flipped around. Like, Kenny uh, Kenny and Cartman grew up to be more kind of likable, responsible, well-rounded adults, while Stan and, like- and Stan and Kyle became, you know, douchebags, basically. They're awful. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and- <laughs> Yeah, and so like, yeah, there was a that was kind of a funny flip and you know commentary on like what's going on. But um, I mean, I can't argue with you. They were, you know, they were annoying. I love the Alexa thing though. That was really good. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I also love how every store is a max or a plus. Yeah, so like, like yeah. the Denny's Applebee's max. <laughs> That was great. Like all those little jokes. Yeah, the visions of the good. future were no, the visions of the future were really great. Uh, like uh yeah. Everybody's in, in the Park, snow yeah. with VR headsets. Like, yeah, it's that. just like, yeah, there's just a lot of I gotta watch it again because I was worried, but like, yeah, there's a lot of fun visual humor and just them kind of <laughs> taking what's happened in the pandemic and blowing it out into this exaggerated look at the future is is really funny. Um, so that's streaming on Paramount Plus, South Park, post-COVID. It's also with the other two specials. So, I mean, if you haven't seen any of this, go watch all three because it's a good block of binge watch and they're and they're really funny. So, yeah, they're connected. Let's so, scratch but... my last one so we can move yep. on to comics. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> running low on time. So let's, yeah, I'll scratch that. We'll talk about that later on. Um, oh, no, so, you can just mention it. Just mention it. All right. So Saved by the Bell season two uh, is on Peacock now. And uh, all the episodes, uh, I believe most of the episodes are, are there. I think they're just doing a straight up binge watch. I don't know if they're doing weeklies. Um, but uh, man, it is, it is. I mean, look, we came out. I remember we, we talked about the first season here. I think it was me and Jamie. Um, you know, like the first season was so good about mixing the original cast and like the original storylines and kind of the over the topness of the show with like really smart self uh you know deprecating comedy and like this season is no different they do tackle uh some larger concepts and things like that and some weightier stuff but they do it in their very tongue-in-cheek way uh and i man it's just super fun like i just this show is so so great uh the dustin diamond tribute is in the very first episode so if you are interested in that that happens really quickly uh earlier in the season um but it's just like they, they do a really good job of when the whole original cast is there like they still like kind of they evolve some of those dynamics and things there's a great episode with zach and his son mac that like they're actually in the they're like going back and forth a little bit because like zach's not governor anymore and so like he has more time on his hands so like there's there's more of that interaction when they are here and it's not just like hey cameo and then he leaves this when they're on screen they're really there and they're like participating so it was cool so you should check that out Mm, maybe all right so we're gonna scratch our other topic we had today and we're gonna end because i want to spend all the rest of our time on comics so man comics this week crazy yeah matt take us in there's some crazy comics this week a lot of comics so a very heavy marvel and it's just because they unleashed like four number ones and like another there was another issue was a lot of marvel so let's start off with hulk number one um because this uh man yeah that's my top dog this week (laughs) so this book uh i got the death of dr strange one so that's what i read (laughs) no no no, it did oh no i pulled i I, yeah Yeah. i pulled the last minute yeah i pulled it all now i have to read it though because everybody is like freaking out over this book (laughs) yeah i I pulled an audible after i saw this i was like it's crazy Uh, no context we got to okay and by the way it was close anyway it was like they were like a percent apart like it was a lot it was like a vote or two yeah so uh Donnie Cates, uh, Ryan Otley, uh, take over the Hulk series um, from the very excellent Immortal Hulk, uh, Al Ewing run. Uh, this is very much a, you can jump in to this, is very, actually very new reader friendly. 
um, because like stuff they're referring to in this book, uh, Kate's kind of clarified some stuff on Twitter. Like there's a, they refer to the El Paso incident that hasn't been revealed yet. Like that's stuff that's going to play out in this series. So like some people were like, did I miss that? Do I need to go back? No, you can start. I from was here. one of those people. Yeah. I said, Screw it. It's a Hulk. Something yeah. happened in El Paso. It was bad. Right. Move on. He said that is going to come up in like, they're going to reveal what happened. He said it's harrowing. <laughs> so that will be a uh, very interesting to see, but we get a flip here. Uh, with Bruce Banner really being the person uh, that is the antagonist of this uh, because of things that have kind of broken him. And the Hulk, he's he's kind of managed to separate himself from the Hulk psyche and really be in the driver's seat. But like he takes that literally like this book, the when you you're you're learning as you go and it's really like it grabs you right off the bat because like you're really interested in like how is Hulk trapped? Wh why is Bruce, you know, so broken? Things like that. And then you see what he actually has done. And when I say driver's seat, like he's essentially created uh, like his it's own Iron Man Hulk. armor. Yeah, yeah, Starship Hulk. He's controlling the body. He's in full control and he powers it with a Hulk engine. And like the way that they explain like how all that flows, it's just like, who, how did you think of that? <laughs> I was like, just like Donnie Cates, say. man. What Donnie Cates did for Venom, like this guy is just. Never, I don't think since Jeff Johns, I've seen somebody who can go into the mess of an established, just convoluted, like tapped out mythos and find some way to just like open a new door that's really fresh and exciting yeah. and, and be like, huh, that's interesting. And just by spinning around the concept a little bit. It's and bonkers. Like, yeah. It's, it's, man, b by the way, uh, Otley's work on Spider Man was great. But like my lord, like oh, that yeah. cover, like if you love that cover, this whole book is just gorgeous. It's so awesome to look at. Uh, yeah, and it's and just so inventive. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, the, I mean, this concept and the way it unfolds, like the writing and the art are the only way you could pull this off. Because like trying to explain to a, a reader in these opening pages, like what Matt said is, I mean, it sounds like we're trying to explain Cable right now, but like. <laughs> Yeah, the way it's unfolded is so exciting because you see Hulk and Banner in the middle of this situation and Betty's back and you're like, what is happening? Yeah, and then it, pull, it keeps pulling back the layers of kind of realization and you're like, oh, this is all inside Bruce Banner's head. And he's made this kind of high tech, it looks like the vault or Cadmus or one of those places that's like this high tech base and it's all in his mind and it's a mind palace, which is a very comic book concept we know, like of uh, the inside of somebody's mind. And he's built this entire kind of machinery, basically a starship where he, you know, his Bruce Banner persona sits in the captain's chair, like Matt said. And he has Hulk locked into this room that's basically the danger room that he keeps throwing fantasy scenarios and attacks to keep Hulk pissed off so he can keep tapping his power as an engine. And on the outside, Hulk is outfitted in all this crazy armor looking like Weapon X and with wings um, and is a starship, essentially. And like, yeah, this whole concept is nuts, but Donny Cates makes it so exciting and so much drama because of just Banner being the antagonist and this whole tagline is so simple, but so revolutionary. What if Hulk exists to protect us from Bruce Banner? That's which such is the a good idea. line. Oh my yeah. God. So which good. is that, you know, the idea that he, this thing was created as a, an outlet for his anger that is safer than actually having Bruce Banner, the man, be anger and having to deal with yeah. all his actual anger. Um, because Bruce Banner, the genius, angry, is a very dangerous thing. Which yeah. is, this book sets up some epic, cry crazy... Donny Cates loves portals. Because, <laughs> yeah. The first thing he does, I mean, after that whole Venom arc in another yeah. dimension, the first thing he does is throw Hulk into a portal to God knows where, where he's going to get some kind of power and come back and we're going to have World War Hulk too, except this time it's like World War Banner or something like yeah. that. Um, yeah. And like, yeah, and it's exciting. And there's so much drama already built in this from the fractures with him just beating down Tony Stark in this comic. Oh, it's always um, good to see a, a Tony fleet Stark of Hulk busters, Yeah. <laughs> to just and to Banner's kind of mental fracture with his friends and other heroes to just what happens that, you know, the Betty figment in his imagination warns him like Hulk is going to get out one day. You know yeah. this. Like, He's, yeah. And that's it. And to Banner in the stakes. Banner saying, I don't care because one day Hulk's going to replace me. I'm dying. Like, and Hulk in the immor is immortal. Great immortal Hulk reference. Like, he's always going to be here. I'm going to disappear one day. Yeah. I'm going to F stuff up before I go. And, like, this kind of desperate thing. There's stakes. Like, I mean, yeah. so, yeah, great it's book. This is man. I was so, I'm like, I'm not, I've never been, like, the biggest Hulk fan. Like, I like Hulk, but I typically like him 
with other characters and stuff more yeah. than I do on his own. I was like, oh, this is a, you know, this is a like I have to read this now, even if I wasn't reviewing it. <laughs> I would have, I would have to read this like all the time. This is great. Uh, so very excited for that. We also have. By the way, I just read literally the first eleven pages when you guys were holy talking. crap. What did you think? Um, this is crazy. <laughs> like. Live comic reading. Love it. I'm completely in awe right now. <laughs> and I'm so confused, but I cannot wait to see what happens. <laughs> oh, my God. That's I awful. just got to him in the armor. Like, that is insane. <laughs> this book is awesome. Okay, I'm excited. Right? Oh, my God. That's awesome. Okay. That couldn't, yeah. have, that couldn't have played out better. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, we got to go to Black Panther. Uh, number one, which is again a relaunch of a very after a very long run. Uh, I'm waiting for Jim to pop up into the comments and say it's too long. <laughs> it's a very long run. It is a little uh, wordy at the end. John Ridley and uh, uh, Juan Cabal uh, take on this, and we again because that last now this one is new reader friendly to an extent, but yeah. if you don't if you don't have any kind of reference point for the last series which like went into space and like he was like t'challa didn't know who he was for bits of that right like there was there's all this stuff so like and their government changed like there's a lot that happened in that last one but i think this one does still do a very good job of taking the key tenets of that and like here's how this works wakanda's like a democracy now or is trying to to figure out to be a democracy um and i love but i love some of the push and pull of that you know like he has a voice but like he's not he can't just say things and they do it now the Shuri stuff with him. Like, I like that there's consequences. Also, it feels like T'Challa is becoming more and more Batman. Like at, at the end of the day of like, Hey, I developed this crazy thing over here that no one knew about. And now something's happened. Now it's exploded. Or now like there's, they've gotten out like Batman as the king of that, you know, like he's always creating stuff that ends up being a threat later on. Like T'Challa yeah. is like slowly gaining <laughs> on him. He's got to stop that. Um, I liked this issue and there's some really interesting stuff here. I didn't love it. And it, part, part of it is because I read it after Hulk. And so, like, Hulk, <laughs> Hulk just kind of, like, was blew me out of the water. And this is very different, very good. I just, I don't know if I loved it, but I liked it a lot. I'm going to keep on it. What do you guys think? I think um, I'm, I'm still warming up to John Ridley, who Oscar-winning, you know, writer, John Ridley, screenwriter, um, has been doing comics. And I'm still, I'm still warming up to his style. I think he does a good job of balancing kind of the – you know, the viewpoint of a black writer and black characters like, um, you know, like a Batman, his Batman and this T'Challa with some of the larger comic booky elements of those characters. Uh, but it's a tough balance. And, and he's still very much a, like an Oscar screenwriter. So like you said, there's a lot of dense stuff. Like this is a dense kind of spy, like a pilot of a spy TV show almost is a lot of this from just the dense conversations between spies and, and talking about spy stuff to the political, you know, intrigue and all that stuff. Um, so it's an interesting mix of stuff to see in a Black Panther comic. And there's a lot here, uh, but it does set the stage for what it's one of those issues. I feel is those necessary first issues to get us somewhere because, you know, at the end, the little preview page of what's coming and the issues is it's basically just a world hunt, right? We got to get to these sleeper agents, Mission Impossible. We got to get to these sleeper agents before these other people do. And we're on a race now. So it did all the work to set it up and, and deal with the canon that came before it. But it it's, looks like it could be an exciting, simple premise of a race to get, you know, an espionage race. So I'm hoping it's that. Yeah. Janelle, what do you think? Yeah. I. It, it's just, uh, it's kind of disheartening for me. Like T'Challa seems not like a good guy. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's, you know, if they're trying to do that, but I don't trust him in this. Like he seems evil to me. Like he's going behind, you know, everyone's backs, creating this secret, you know, group of people. And he doesn't trust anyone. He seems very paranoid. People are kind of like, yo, what is wrong with you? He's disrespectful at like a meeting with all of these officials and I just, I don't really like him in this book at all. So I hope that either like, he's even like kind of a jerk to Steve Rogers about the Avengers. And like, I don't know. I'm just, I, I don't know. I, is that intentional? Because 
am I, maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but it just, I'm like, oh no, I don't like you in this book. Why? I don't like, like that kind of like freaks me out because I've never like not liked him. Right. <laughs> so I, I hope that there's like a payoff and there's a reason for this. Uh, and, you know, yes, very Batman. It felt very Batman. Like, like just, he's just so mistrusting of everyone right now. And he's, he's so like alone feeling. So I hope that like, he kind of gets, <laughs> I don't know what he, what he wants. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, know. I think this book is doing a good job of just showing the complexity of being the King, a hero, and, you know, and a political figure in this changing world where yeah. Wakanda is right now. Yeah. Um, and that's what this book does. It deals with T'Challa in a lot more shades of gray than just noble King T'Challa. I just like, didn't yeah. even like yeah. the way that he talked to Doctor Strange in the opening sequence. He's Look, kinda, man, he's just disrespectful. Just because he insulted your boyfriend. <laughs> don't he's get rude. Mad. Pause it in. It's, but I, I only brought you along so you can do this. And if you can't do it, like it just sounded like kind of bratty. Like, well, here's so here's the thing. I think what I what I like about this because I feel like both of you bring up really good points. What I like about this is that it's messy. It yeah. doesn't feel like like because I do feel like at times he is very headstrong. He's brash. He thought about, you know, like there's a discussion he's having at one point about like the new democracy. And, and he makes some valid points, by the way. I don't even like hate when he's in the council and he walks out. Oh, and yeah. he makes his joke. I thought that was hilarious because like, I was like, oh, I it get was. it. How frustrating would that be if you were literally leading a year ago and you could just like that say it and it'd be done and get forward movement and now you got a debate and you got to have it all this thing like he sees that as a as a roadblock mm -hmm. and you understand why but then you know he goes and like his conversation with shuri like i love that because she's like you're making it really hard like there's really good stuff here but i like that it's messy but i agree with janelle i feel like it needs to he needs to evolve and we need to see that growth because like I sometimes just hope they we, didn't write him too cold yeah because like, he is no he is kind of a because i love he's him getting close to that batman he is getting close to that bruce yeah. Wayne. Um, as he should yeah we got we got moved to uh death of dr strange number three um which uh was the poll winner thank you thank you guys everybody um yes thank and, you everyone who votes for dr strange <laughs> love you guys uh, i almost when that happened by the way i almost thought like okay janelle retweeted that and was like come on dr. i Strange swear Army. i did it i voted uh, though i totally yeah. voted <laughs> um, so this one and i don't know how to pronounce the the <laughs> the name of the, the person here is it peregrine, is it peregrine? I, that's how i was saying okay it peregrine child. peregrine child. peregrine child um so we actually, we've been hearing a lot about this and like this person, this child and stuff in this story. We finally get to see them and they are like, it's so weird. It's such a, it's like when a design really makes an, an impact on you and it's like, it's like a baby, but then it's got like, I thought it was a mustache at first. Like I really did. It was like a look at <laughs> long mustache. And I was like, what is this? But it's it's the simplicity that is so off-putting. Like if I saw that, <laughs> if I saw someone that looked like that, like in my window, I would freak out. Um, well, so I mean, like, it's Lovecraftian. I mean, it's, right. it's pure Lovecraft stuff. And even the concept they described, I was like, yo, Lovecraft's going to sue your ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we actually get so, uh, some movement on both sides. We get a movement on the investigation of like, what actually happened to the original strange we understand why we also uh get movement of like who took certain things because like there's a reveal at one point that like certain things are missing and then we kind of get forward movement on the three mothers and like and the child and why the child eats what that's like all that stuff there's a lot going on here my favorite part and i i liked all of it actually i thought this was like a really full issue like there's a lot going on here and they pack a lot into 22 pages or whatever but the most interesting part i actually thought was uh the clay stuff because like their conversation is just on a bench is so interesting because she has like at one point she's talking about like how strange wiped memories and took those away he was trying to save the world but like you know what i mean so she didn't remember that like her love for him and then after he died it all came rushing back and now she has all these feelings and things and he's not there, but the person that is there is one from the past and hasn't formed all those. Like that, to me, that right there is like a book on its own. Like that's a whole series. And I was like, man, like that stuff is so rich. And so I loved, that was my favorite part of the issue. All the other stuff is really cool, but like that was the part that I came away most going like, I want to see more of that. Um, and so I, I dug this issue, but there's a lot going on. What'd you guys think? 
Um, I thought it was good, but it's it's very much an issue three. Like it's very yeah. much like we're in the middle of stuff, and this is kind of shifting around the pieces a little bit. Um, they give you some reveals with the Peregrine Child, and some good battle sequences, some good magical fights in this with you know Mordo and all that. But um, yeah, it's very much an issue three. It's just a development part of the story, and since there's only five of these, it's one where you got to do you know a lot of a lot development. Of, yeah. Janelle, what'd you so, think? Yeah. yeah, agreed. I mean, I I love I love the storyline. I'm really excited about it, and I'm having a blast. But yeah, it's it I, it, it was great for me. I loved it. I'm <laughs> I'm having a blast. <laughs> but um, you said everything perfectly, and we'll see we'll see where we go from here. For sure. Uh, last book uh, of the week is fitting. Hawkeye, Kate Bishop. Uh, number one, uh, a, a limited series. <laughs> a limited series. <laughs> well, okay. So, um, I will probably say without, I don't think any real pushback, I'm probably the biggest Kate Bishop fan here, probably. Right. So, yeah. uh, Kofi has a question in the, in the layout here, which I think is, uh, is really interesting because, uh, it's, is comic Kate still better than MCU Kate? And what I will say to that is, I will not say better or worse. I actually think I love Haley Steinfeld's version of K. I think she's actually a perfect casting for that for that character. I just think they're equally as great because I actually like what she does. However, this issue I didn't love as much as I wanted to. Like this was one of those issues where I really wanted to love this book, uh, and you get essentially kind of a setup of you know she's still got Hawkeye investigations. Um, she's kind of. You know, it's 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 weird. It's kind of like you're you're seeing her do her job and like balance stuff with like her and her friends and, and things. And but it's just, I don't know. There wasn't anything that really like some of the banter's there. It wasn't as as bantery. Like the banter didn't hit as hard as I wanted it to. And like I don't know. I just didn't leave this issue being like, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited for the next issue. Like I'm going to read it because I'm curious to see if maybe that picks up. I just didn't, there, there wasn't a lot here. There wasn't a lot of meat on this bone. And I just was like, ah, oh, I was disappointed. Um, art is is nice, but I just didn't, I didn't pull this. I would recommend you go read some of her older books, read West Coast Avengers by Kelly Thompson or Hawkeye K. Bishop by Kelly Thompson. Uh, if you, or, or even Matt Fraction's Hawkeye run, because she's such a big part of it. Like I would say for quintessential K. Bishop, you go there. Uh, this I wouldn't say is that, but that's just me. What you guys needed think? more Clint Barton? Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Why? No, like he isn't West Coast Avengers, own. by the way. So, I know. I'm just messing with you. Um, no, it, it, it was lukewarm. This wasn't my favorite. There's been a lot better kind of female heroine debuts we've done like yeah. lately, and this just—I mean, even Black Widow was like ten times better than this. Um, so yeah, it was all right. I mean, it's forgettable. Out of but I think also from the. Out of all the debuts we had this week, this was kind of by far the weakest. And it wasn't right. really a reinvention. It's just kind of a slow trip home to re reunite with her other West Coast Avengers. So Yeah, I didn't no. feel like I learned anything new. And no. it was a bummer. It felt it very much felt like kind of a, a repeat, which is weird because if you go read West Coast Avengers, it feels like that. So uh real quick, if you uh are looking for other comics, DC versus Vampires number two also came out and was excellent. It was so good. Uh, also, House of Slaughter 2 and the Suicide Squad trade paperback volume one is out as well. So those are all great stuff for the holidays if you're looking for stuff to binge. But that's comics. All right. That'll do it for this episode of Comic Book Nation. We want to thank Rob Keys from Screen Rant for hopping on again to help us celebrate Hawkeye in his uh, two TV series. We gave you guys a good fun rundown of good TV, geek TV watching or weird that you can get into right now over the holiday weekend. So enjoy all of that. And we will be back next week. If you like Comic Book Nation, we are on all your favorite podcast platforms, Apple, uh, iHeartRadio, Google, Spotify, all that stuff. If you want to watch us and you miss the live broadcast, you can rewatch us on the comicbook.com Twitch page, comicbook.com Facebook page, or the comicbook.com YouTube, YouTube page where you can uh, replay any of our um, episodes and see our smiling, shining faces. If you like the show, go on to the at comicbook.com or at Comic Book Nation Twitter account and give us a like and subscribe to the podcast on Apple. Thank you. That'll do it for this episode. We will be back next week. Peace. Bye, guys. Deuces. <laughs>